You have questions? What is uh, slashing? We have answers. Slashing is um, like that. <coughs> mm -hmm. And um, there's a penalty for that? Yeah. You do that, you go to the box, you know, two minutes by yourself, and you feel shame, you know, and then you get free. This is CBJ in 30. Anything you folks want to know about the fascinating world of pro hockey, here we go. Tweet your questions by using the hashtag CBJIN30. We'd like to remind you folks, keep your questions within the boundaries of good taste. Here's your host, Bob McGilligan. Well, and how about this? CBJ and 30, whole new format. It's a whole new day. It is Thursday, the 19th day of June, 2014. And we, well, we're YouTubing today now. The only thing that could possibly be worse than listening to me for 30 minutes a day is looking at me and listening to me for 30 minutes a day, right? Well, glad to try the new format today, see how this all works out, and glad to have you aboard. Of course, your questions and your comments, you can still send them the way that you always do, and you can do that by using Twitter and using the hashtag CBJIn30. As we get uh, closer to the draft, and again, this is, the, uh, this is the time when there's not a lot going on in the National Hockey League. There's a lot of rumors. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of things that, uh, you know, a lot of things that might happen, and then there are things that may never happen as it all goes along. Uh, one of the news items today, uh, supposedly last night it was tweeted out that the Penguins are down to two candidates for their head coaching position. can tell you for sure one of them is not going to be John Stevens of the Los Angeles Kings. As a matter of fact, there was a report yesterday that the Kings – had uh, been telling teams that were requesting permission to talk to him to be their head coach, no, we will not give you permission to do that. And then we found out why later in the day as John Stevens was promoted to uh, associate head coach of the Los Angeles Kings. Davis Payne, another assistant, he got an extension. Bill Ranford, the goaltending coach, he got an extension yesterday too. Now, why would the Los Angeles Kings do that? You do not have to be a genius to figure it out. Just take a look at Daryl Sutter. Daryl Sutter... He's a great coach. He has won two Stanley Cups in three years with the L.A. Kings. But he's an older guy, and he's a guy that, well, how much longer is he going to be there? Does anybody know? Um, he probably knows in his mind what he would like to do, or he probably has some kind of an idea of how much longer he would like to be there. But the fact of the matter is, for the Los Angeles Kings, they're already looking at continuity, and uh, they're looking at the future. And in their mind, at this moment right now, the plan is obvious. And that plan would be whenever Daryl Sutter is done being the head coach of the Los Angeles Kings, and I, that would be by his choice. Nobody else is going to make that choice. That's going to be Daryl Sutter deciding when he no longer wants to coach in the NHL. When he is done, John Stevens is obviously going to step into that role as the head coach of the L.A. Kings. No-brainer. Absolute no-brainer. They keep continuity. They get a good coach, and, and it had to be okay with him. It had to have been okay with him. And if you are John Stevens, why wouldn't it be okay with you? You know, instead of going and interviewing with the Vancouver Canucks and not knowing what the whole situation is there, you know, new GM, Trevor Linden's now running the thing. Uh, you know, he's the president of Hockey Ops. Jim Benning's a new GM. Uh, you have a lot of players that you have some that are in flux, like Ryan Kessler. Is he going to be there? Is he not going to be there? Uh, you've got the Sedin twins, obviously. You, you've got a you've got a core, but there's you can make the argument as to whether or not that core is on the upswing, as to whether or not they're leveled off or if they're ready to go down the other direction. So, it's a you know it's a crapshoot scenario there. And if you go into Vancouver and you don't turn that team around right away as a coach, then you're probably automatically on the hot seat, and and they're looking for somebody else within a short period of time anyway. The Pittsburgh Penguins, I thought the Penguins would be a good fit for John Stevens, although some Penguins fans might have had a problem with that because, well, he was the head coach of the Philadelphia Flyers, and the people in Pittsburgh don't tend to like the people in Philadelphia and vice versa. It really doesn't mesh very well. So I think he would have been a good coach there. I think he could have done some good things there. But, again, you're going into a situation where it's a, it's a win-now mentality. It's uh, you, You've got to get it done right now, and if you don't, get things turned around in a very short period of time, again, then you have the chance of being written off and, and somebody else comes in there. Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes, I, I think of the 
you know, of the three teams that I'm talking about, I'm trying to figure out now if Carolina is in the boat with Vancouver or if they're not in a boat with Vancouver. Is Carolina going to be a team that's going to challenge to get into the postseason this coming year, uh, or are they not? And they're different from Vancouver, where Vancouver has uh, those, you know, high-caliber players that they've had for a long time, and and they've been there, and they've gone to a Stanley Cup final. And the Carolina Hurricanes have been kind of muddling along since they were in the uh, Stanley Cup final in 2006, and they're just kind of plodding there, and, and they've got some good players, and they can't seem to supplement them. They're a budget team. I don't know how much it plays into it. You can still win as a budget team, but you've got to have all the right pieces for that to come to fruition. So they are, uh, you know, to lead the L.A. Kings, if you're John Stevens, if Carolina's interested in you, uh, Florida Panthers, you know, they've got a lot of good young players. They have the potential to be a very good team at some point in the future. But here's my whole long, long point. If you're John Stevens, you're already on a team that is set up as a somewhat dynasty team in a salary cap era. It's not easy to, to win as much as the Kings have or the Blackhawks have in the last couple of years. And they look to be set for a while. So if Daryl Sutter's not going to stay much longer, why would you not just hang out, be the top assistant, get that promotion to associate head coach, get a raise, and kind of hang around and wait. And when Daryl Sutter decides to ride off into the sunset, you take the job. Team has continuity. They know you well. The system would probably be the same. Everything would stay the same. You just have a different head coach, a younger guy who has been there and has a ton of experience and has been a head coach somewhere else before. So I think for John Stevens, he has to be happy there because people can come to you and say, hang out for another year and we'll make you the head coach. But believe me, if Daryl Sutter wants to stay beyond another year, he will. He's earned it. He's deserved it. So maybe it'll be a year. Maybe it'll be two years. Obviously, John Stevens isn't worried about how long it's going to take. He's going to stay with a proven winner. He's going to stay with players that he knows extremely well. He's going to stay in a situation that not only is good now, but is going to be good for a while. So, you know, there's something to be said for that. I think there's something to be said for that anyway. You know, have a uh, – that's where he wants to be. That's where he's going to stay. So that takes him off the board. So now the question is, with those other jobs, what guys are going to be the ones that wind up in position to be the head coach? Well, Florida seems like it's down to former uh, Blue Jackets coach Gerard Gallant and Dan Bilesma. And I don't know who has the advantage there. It's easy to say that Bilesma has the advantage in that one. But because Gallant was with Jonathan Huberto in St. John when he played in the Quebec Major Junior League, you know, he has a little bit of clout there. And he was just coming off the bench of being an assistant with the Montreal Canadiens, who performed pretty well, got into the Eastern Conference Final. So, it, you know, there's varying viewpoints as to what direction you want to go there. Dan Bilesma obviously is the more proven guy because he has a Stanley Cup ring as a head coach. So you could go with him. And, it, you know, and then Bilesma, Bilesma has to decide, you want to go there to, you know, and, and be the guy that nurtures that situation and brings all the young guys together and wins with those young guys. And, again, Dan Bilesma still has some time on his contract with Pittsburgh. If he decides that, you know, if it came down to the fact he doesn't want to do anything, he doesn't have to do anything. He could sit and collect a paycheck and wait for a better situation, wait for the year to start and somebody to get let go and maybe get himself in a better situation. But who knows? Who knows? It looks like he's he and Gerard Gallant are the front runners there. You know, um, in Pittsburgh, it's it's interesting because there are some that are saying maybe uh, Alf Samuelson winds up going there from the Rangers bench as an assistant coach. Obviously, the Carolina Hurricanes were waiting for the Rangers to be done in the Stanley Cup final so they could talk with Alf Samuelson. Samuelson is a former Pittsburgh Penguin. His son plays in the organization, as a matter of fact. I don't know if that's a conflict of interest or not. But uh, then there's Ron Wilson, who's out there and has won. Uh, will they go that route? And I could see that. I, I'm That's the one I'm watching to see what they do there, and it's because of Jim Rutherford, who's such a an established guy in the NHL with those 30 years with the Carolina Hurricanes. So he, he knows everybody, but he especially knows guys – like the Ron Wilsons and uh, the Mark Crawfords, another guy whose name has been uh, knocked around about that job. Guys that are former head coaches in the NHL have had success and have been around a while. 
If Jim Rutherford goes with a guy like that, it won't surprise me because he's been around for a while. And he has a, you know, he knows these guys. He knows what he is getting when he signs one of those guys up for the job. He knows exactly what he's getting. If he goes with John Hines, who's the coach in Wilkesbury, I don't know that he knows what he's getting. He can look at the record. He's had interviews with him. He's had at least one anyway. I don't I don't know how many he's had, but I know he's had one. Do you, you know, do you go with a young coach? Do you think that you can get what you need out of your stars like Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin? Uh, that's it's a big decision. It's an interesting decision. I'm just saying if Ron Wilson ends up getting named as the head coach of the Penguins, it won't shock me at all. If Mark Crawford does, that wouldn't shock me at all. You know, Mark Crawford is a guy that has uh, had limited shelf life as a coach in different places that he's gone. I just read something yesterday or the day before saying, well, he has changed. He, he's not nearly as confrontational. And he's not, you know, it's, it's this kind of, well, with today's player, you have to be more sensitive. Well, the Penguins just let go a guy that was pretty sensitive in Dan Bilesma. Maybe they do want to go in that other direction. Not to the extent of, let's bring in Mike Keenan. That's that. That's 180 degrees in the other direction. Maybe they'd be more comfortable going 100, 110, not 180. So that'll be interesting. And uh, who was it said? Somebody just said the other day. I was I was kind of chuckling to myself. Was it the Panthers? I think said they'll have somebody. Uh, they expect to have somebody by the draft. Again, if Pittsburgh's down to two, they're going to have a coach by the draft. And I told you here a couple of days ago, I'd be shocked if there's one team that goes into the draft with no coach. It can happen. Or maybe they bring a guy in and they interview him in Philadelphia. And, but it can happen. I just don't think it will happen. I just I just think they would like to have – I think teams would like to have that portion of what they have to do in the offseason taken care of before they get to the next phase, which is drafting players, signing players, development camp. And the development camps that teams do are not normally run by the head coach anyway. I understand that. They're usually run by the player development coach. But the head coach is usually around, and he's usually taking a look. And it gives him a chance to get to get – a lot of times minor league staff is brought in to help with that development camp as well, which gives you an opportunity to get all of your coaches together, and talk about philosophies and systems and all of that before regular training camp in September. So we'll see what happens with all of that. All right, lots of questions to answer today. I promised Allison yesterday I would answer her question, and I didn't do it. We were we had some technical problems yesterday when we had Brad Larson, the uh, new assistant coach for the Blue Jackets, on, and I totally forgot to answer Allison's question. Allison's question that I said the day before that I would answer, and I and I didn't. And the question was, and I'd been sent this three times and didn't have the answer. The question was, how many sticks does a typical NHL player go through? during the course of a season. So Tim Leroy, our equipment manager, our head equipment manager, was actually here after the show the other day when I said I would look into this. And I went in and I sat down with him. And he had to think about it for a while because, as I told you, there are some players that will use more sticks than other players. Some guys will break more sticks. Some guys, if they don't break a stick, they like to stay with the same stick for a while. Other guys will change just for the sake of changing. But he said... You can basically figure that a player goes through a stick per game. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 sticks per season. I don't know if with a microphone I'm using you can hear the music going on in the background here, but in case you do, they're, they're getting ready for some event that's going on here, and, and they're playing some music in the background that sounds like it would normally be in the elevator. So if you hear that, and if I start to nod off, that's why. That kind of music, like it's like sitting in the dentist chair, which is a bad enough experience before the music. All right, let's let's take a look at uh, some of the questions that you have for me today here on CBJ and Thirty. Again, use the hashtag CBJIN30. It's uh, very very simple to do. CBJ Therapy has a good question today. What do goalies do differently than skaters when it comes to off-season conditioning and getting ready for the season? Well, I don't know specifically. Uh, some things are similar, some things are not. But I can tell you, I talked with goaltending coach Ian Clark a couple of weeks ago. It's actually a conversation we haven't had a chance to finish yet. We got cut off when he was driving somewhere, and we haven't finished the conversation. But I was asking him this because when my son gets done playing baseball, I want him to do some hockey workouts to prepare for the upcoming hockey season. And since he is a goalie, 
I went to Ian Clark and asked him about this very question. What do you do? And, you know, he talked about uh, – he. the first thing he said to me, it's a very different workout than a regular player goes through. And there's a lot of there's a lot of work on the core, which players do that too. But there's an extreme amount of work uh, working on uh, your core and getting stronger in the core. And, of course, your uh, – your foot movement, your speed, because you want to have that lateral speed to be able to go from post to post. So those were some of the things he talked about. And as I said, we started to get into detail and then he got cut off and, and I need to finish that conversation with him. But I know for sure that those are some things that he stresses right off the top to, uh, to do. And, and again, Sergei Bobrovsky, it's become, it's become a legend how long he spends doing cardio and riding the bike. I'm telling you on the road, and it's great for me sometimes. It's great for me because if I have things to do, especially after a game, you know, I'm trying to, to wrap up these interviews and I'm trying to get the sound sent out to radio stations and back here to, for the website and all of that stuff. And, and I'm looking around and I'm always trying to figure out how much time do I have before the bus is going to leave. And as soon as I see Sergey on the bike, I know I've got a minimum of 30 minutes. It's a beautiful thing. Works out great. But that's his routine, and he, he spends a ton of time on that bike. That's, um, you know, the cardio for him is one of the basic features of his training and of his game. No question about that. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's some real jokesters on here with this. I'm glad somebody posted a still picture of me. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for tweeting that out to the world. Really appreciate that. That's you, T1 Tesla. That's who I'm talking to, you, right? Thanks a lot. Great. Ah, uh, let me see. Let's go through this. Um, CBJ or die. What do you see being Artem and Isimov's line mates next season? Who works with him best? Well, I, again, that it's going to depend who's here and who's not. You know, you saw Nick Foligno playing with him at the end of the year uh, with R.J. Umberger. If R.J.'s not in the mix, as he is, you know, hoping that he's not in the mix, uh, having requested a trade, somebody else is going to step in there and, and take that job. So and, until you have the, the roster set and you figure out, I mean, you know, if you were going based upon what you finished with last year, and if Blake Como was going to be a part of the mix, he's an unrestricted free agent. So let's say you were going to resign Blake Como. Does he jump up and, and play there with Felino and, and Artem and Isimov and that leave you with a McKenzie Latestu bowl fourth line? You know, the way you ended the season, you'd go, that, that would be the guess that you would make. Or maybe you would put Latestu there and uh, let him do a little bit of playmaking. But the fact of the matter is you don't really know what you're doing fully yet. And you don't know which guys are going to come into development camp, and if any, and make a big impression, and then go into training camp and make a big impression. Because that, that could happen too. So it's a, it could be, could be somebody that is uh, not even on the radar. Not even on the radar. Let's see, Frederick S. Caro the second. Really? Wow, that sounds very official. But I wouldn't want to sign your checks. Uh, who do you think will make the biggest off-season moves? Great question. Who will make the biggest off-season moves? Well, it depends upon when you say the biggest off-season moves. Are you talking about uh, biggest being in the players that are that are switched or, or traded or? moved out or brought in, or are you talking about the most number of players that somebody's going to send in or out? You know, the Boston Bruins are talking about making some big moves. They've been talking about that. And the funny thing is, other than saying they're not going to re-sign Sean Thornton, it's been pretty quiet. Nothing's really come out of Boston and, and what's going on there. Whereas you have the San Jose Sharks, who basically come out and said they might move uh, Patrick Marlowe, they might move uh, Joe Thornton if it's something that they can do. And I'll tell you this, if they move, to me, if they move one or both of those guys, there's your answer. Because those would be big moves to uh, switch one or both. If they move them both out, it's a hands-down, no contest winner. But even one of those guys being moved out of there, to me, would be a, a pretty big deal. Yeah, and Boston's going to tweak some things and change some things. You know, they talked about Brad Marchand and maybe dealing him somewhere. I don't know. You know, there's uh, maybe this is the calm before the storm, right? Or, or maybe, how many times they talk about every year you go into this, you get right, right before the draft, 
you hear all of the pundits saying, well, this could be the time the teams are going to make moves. Unlike during the regular season when teams are under the constraints of the salary cap, they know what they have to work with during the summer. They know what they can do. Uh, they can go over the cap for a little bit and then kind of make up for that later before the season starts if they want to, you know, and they talk about maybe this will be the year that we have 10 guys move teams and then nobody moves and nothing happens and it's all drummed up stuff. Not drummed up. I, they all hope it happens. They all hope it happens. I mean, what do we have to talk about when there's nothing happening? Nothing. So they hope it happens. They hope some guys are moved. You know, they hope Ryan Kessler has moved to the Ducks or the Blues. Or Jason Spetz has moved to the Blues or the Ducks. I wonder what will happen with that, too. I wonder if whoever doesn't get Kessler gets Spetz and vice versa. I wonder if the Canucks wind up putting Kessler in the Western Conference or if an Eastern Conference team winds up being uh, the guy that gets his services. That would be an interesting one to watch for sure. That will be a good one to watch. All right, let's sift through them here. And Somebody had asked me. I don't see it right now. Oh, here it is. Christopher Burnett. This is for you, Christopher. If you could add any current player to the Blue Jackets roster, ignoring salary cap, contracts, etc., who would it be and why? Also, in other words, Christopher, if I were playing a video game, who would I put in a Blue Jacket sweater? Because that's kind of what we're talking about here. Well, I think for years, the hands-down answer would have been Sidney Crosby, without even a thought, without missing a beat. And I think now, and this was talked about a lot during the playoffs, I think now you have to take a beat just long enough to wonder if it should be Jonathan Tays instead of Sidney Crosby. But I'd still go with one of those two guys. I'm intrigued by Drew Doughty. I'm not going to lie to you. But with a team that needs more scoring, and I know Doughty can score from the blue line. I get it. But I, for a team that needs more scoring, I think that no-brainer is you go with one of those two guys. They're both captains. Well, they both have leadership. Which one has better leadership? That's another thing that's kind of been quietly talked about. Quietly talked about. And the funny thing is, both of those guys are quiet guys. They're not, they're not big vocal leader kind of guys. They're, you know, they lead by example. They do what they do, and they expect people to follow suit. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. But again, the Penguins, the year they won the Stanley Cup, I think the biggest key acquisition that they made was when they got Bill Guerin, and they brought him in there. And I think he became that support system that Sidney Crosby needed. He he brought the veteran presence. He, uh, you know, he commanded respect just by who he was and the way he plays the game. And he gave them an intangible they didn't have. But again, he could play the game. He wasn't like, you know, hey, I'm going to contribute nothing, but I'll do all this talking and you guys will all of a sudden turn it around. He, not like that. He can still play the game and still do things well. And that's why, in my opinion, that Jim Rutherford is using him as he is as an assistant general manager now that's going to have most of the dealings with the players, which is what he did in Carolina with Ron Francis, who then was promoted to take his job. Ron Francis, the stories are that Ron Francis did most of the dealings with the players. He was the guy that was in the dressing room, and rightfully so, quite frankly. I mean, Jim Rutherford played in the National Hockey League, but he played as a goaltender 40 years ago. You know, Ron Francis, not, you know, he's, it's been a long time since he's played, too, but he's more current guy. And he's uh, he was a pretty darn good player throughout his career. Hartford, Pittsburgh, Carolina. So, you know, send him down there and have him deal with the players, and, and there's that instant respect level. And that's what Rutherford is doing now in Pittsburgh with Bill Guerin. It, it does make me laugh, though. It makes me think of uh, the movie Moneyball. If you saw that movie or, or read the book, but especially in the in the movie, when uh, they're on the plane and the guy's playing David Justice asks the uh, assistant GM there why Billy Bean doesn't travel, why he keeps to himself, and he, and he makes up some answer for him, and he says uh, something to the effect of, is it easier to cut guys? 
Who knows? I'm, well, I'm sure it would be easier. It's always hard to tell your buddies to beat it, to hit the road. I know it's a business, but, you know, it's just. Well, well, look what the Kings are going through right now with Mike Richards. Mike Richards is owed a boatload of money in the next couple of years, and he was playing fourth line. I mean, in the real scheme of things, should the Kings keep a fourth-line player at the money that he's going to make the next couple of years? Probably not. But they like him a lot. He's a likable guy. He gets along well there. I don't know what's going to happen there. I mean, if you do it with your head, you probably buy him out. If you do it with your heart, he probably stays. So I, I don't know. That, that'll be another another situation to watch. And, of course, those compliance buyouts, the window is until June 30th, and the free agency period starts on July the 1st. So being the 19th, you still have 11 days, and some guys might wind up popping up on the buyout list. Jordan Tutu popped up on the buyout list, put on waivers by the Detroit Red Wings. That's a oh, well. I mean, he had... Uh, you know, he spent all those years in Nashville, and then he went to Detroit and wound up spending time in the American Hockey League this year. So for him, he's looking for a fresh start somewhere. And you know, and he's had his off-ice issues as well. So he's, I, I think he really is looking for a fresh start. But he's a guy that the, that the Red Wings have decided to uh, say so long to. be interesting to see what they do with their situation too. See if they get into the uh, Dan Boyle thing. Because now the, the Islanders are talking about trading his rights before free agency starts. Again, Garth Snow a couple of weeks ago went out and got his traded to get his negotiating rights from the San Jose Sharks, who had told him he wasn't coming back. And then it was nothing, 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 nothing. And now ah, I think we might try to trade his rights. Don't be surprised to see Pittsburgh get into that, too. Pittsburgh and Detroit are two pretty good fits for a guy like Dan Boyle. And Pittsburgh especially if they can't keep Matt Niskanen. If they can keep Niskanen, then it's a whole different game. But if they feel he's going to get away, he's going to go somewhere else and get paid a lot of money. And if one, if they're out on Niskanen, or when they are out on Niskanen, however it works, Dan Boyle would be a, a decent option in Pittsburgh, I think. So that'll be that'll be one to watch and see where where he winds up and where he shows up. What's this question? Do you see John Tortorella going anywhere? No, not right now. But again, he's one of those guys that uh, he'll pop up again. He'll get to a point and he'll pop up again. Last time he was out of work, he went on TSN as a commentator, which is great because you never know what he's going to say. But you know, somebody will get into a situation again. There will be a team that will get into a situation where they'll say, you know, we need somebody to drop the hammer on these guys. Who can we get? I know a guy out of work. John Tortorella. And I really think, and I think this because of talking with Jody Shelley, who had him as a coach in New York, I really think that it's more of the media that cringes with a guy like John Tortorella than the players. Well, I can tell you this. From talking to Jody and Tom Sestito out in uh, Vancouver, listening to them talk to each other and then talking to them individually as well, they both love the guy. They think he's fair. They think he's, uh, you know, he's, He's kind of a, a proponent of their game and what they do. So they liked him a lot, and they enjoyed playing for him. He'll show up somewhere. When? I don't know. During the season? Maybe. After the season? Maybe. Two years from now? Maybe. He'll show up again. They always do. They always do. Just when you think a guy's gone, he shows up again. Mike Keenan's name was bantered about for open coaching positions. He won a cup with the Rangers 20 years ago. Now, he was in the KHL, and he won a championship there this year. But um, that's what I mean. They don't, they don't go away. They only disappear for a short period of time. Simple as that. Well, I hope you like the new format today. Hope it worked out for you. I mean, I now I've got a shower before every show. It's ridiculous. You know, audio show, you just show up. Ball cap. Now you got to, and I know what you're thinking. Yeah, you might have tried to pretty yourself up, but it didn't work. Oh, well. Hey, thanks for watching and listening to, the, to today's show. There we go. Bob McElligot saying so long.
Later.